Thanksgiving to you and to everybody watching us right now. Um, saying hi from not so sunny Las Vegas today. Isn't Hello, everybody. You were telling me that you expect snow tomorrow. That's amazing. Yeah, actually, we already had some flurries this morning, at least in this part of uh, Las Vegas where I'm at, not the entire Las Vegas Valley, of course. But yeah, it's going to be a snowy Thanksgiving for us. At least that's the forecast. That, that is amazing. Albert, let's get right into the interview. Uh, tell me, what, what was the year that you guys joined us here at ABS? Yes, so uh, actually it was uh, around April or May of 2012. I heard you say a few minutes ago that you kind of serve different roles right now in uh, ABS and you're doing research, marketing or whatever. But I remember in April or May of 2012, you were the guy that everybody would get in touch with whenever you send any uh, inquiry into yeah. signing up. I don't know if you still do that, but yeah. And I finally got to meet you in person when we attended the the uh, live training at that time. Okay. So, um, that was in Dallas and that's November. Uh, I mean, the last week of October up to November 2nd, I think. Uh, yeah. Or yeah, October of uh, 2012. And in fact, you see my picture there holding the certificate uh, that was taken on my birthday. I was in training on my birthday in the, in uh, 2012. There you go. I mean, what a what a great birthday present has turned out for you. And yes, I, I do talk a little bit to, to folks, not as much as I used to, but uh, I still have a few folks that I, I enjoy, you know, being with Patrick on the webinars every, usually about, just about every Wednesday, unless we're doing an interview. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still very heavily involved. What, what I've been able to do a little bit more is, is to do some uh, research and development because again, as we grow, uh, marketing kind of changes. We haven't really changed a whole lot, I mean, in training, except we've, we've, we've kind of made it a little bit more easily to, to get some, some training done. Uh, and we've expanded that. We continue to keep growing that. Um, but what I've been able to do is really go out there and find some key elements that are really helping some licensees get out there and market, get themselves known, because that's one of the things that you mentioned earlier when we were talking earlier, because I asked you just flat out, because I know the question is going to come up, Albert, how did you get your first client? So let's kind of just start right there. We'll kind of talk about some of the marketing things that you did, some of the things that worked, some of the things that maybe didn't work. So, you know, this is, this is just, let's just, just have a discussion here. Yeah, I mean, uh, it wasn't easy. I mean, it was uh, kind of tough for me uh, not having any background in sales at all, as in zero. So I didn't know how to uh, sell something. I didn't know how to speak to somebody to offer some kind of service. I had zero, absolutely zero experience in that. So uh, before I jump into what actually worked and what did not, at least for me, uh, let me just tell you that it actually took me 13 months before I signed up my very first client. Um, 13 months, that's more than a year. Uh, I mean, probably it never occurred to me to give up. Uh, I, I'd like yeah. to say that uh, straight out right away. It never occurred to me to give up, but I'm just saying that if it's if it was somebody else, you know, some people might have already given up. And in fact, I know of a, a fellow licensee of mine. We went into training together. Uh, she was also here in Las Vegas. I remember that about six months into the process after we graduated from the training, um, she already gave up, I did not. And it took us 13 months, Army and I, uh, it took us 13 months to finally sign up our first client. And it was unforgettable for me because um, we signed up that client uh, in 2013, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, which is today, right? So yeah. it's kind of an anniversary for us. So we, we had a contract signed on the evening of Wednesday before Thanksgiving. The reason why I remember this uh, very uh, clearly is because once I went home, I had the contract in my hand. We were kind of saying, now what? I mean, we didn't know what to do. We have a contract and the next four <laughs> days were holidays. There was nobody to call. We couldn't sleep. We didn't know what to do. And thankfully, at the following business day, Monday, we were able to call at support, ABS support, and they yeah. guided us what to do step by step on uh, what accounts to open, uh, what papers we need to complete, and, and all of those steps. So the, the thing is, uh, it was uh, four sleepless nights for us simply because we didn't know what to do. But uh, so, like I said, it took us 13 months to sign our first, very first client, 13 months after we uh, graduated from training. So right. it wasn't easy. Now, I 
told you a while ago, I'll go back to what actually worked for us and what did not. So uh, during the training, we were presented with several different options, you know, mail marketing, email marketing, uh, right. putting up booths, uh, giveaways, uh, door to door. We tried all of those. The only thing I, I the only thing I did not uh, try was uh, setting up a booth in a health fair or whatever. Right. Uh, although I understood that uh, ABS would be actually providing us the materials, uh, the booth uh, virtually that we just need to kind of set up, assemble. That's the only thing we did not, I did not try. And also uh, there's something else I did not try. I did not try to go into the, what do you call that? The networking, the, right. the attending these uh, business mixers, or I think that's what they call them. Uh, right. The only reason I did not try that is because I, I was too scared. Like I said, I didn't know how to sell anything. I, I, I knew that during the training, they kind of made all of us develop some kind of an elevator pitch or whatever. Right. I had that. I simply did not have the courage to do it. So those are the two things that I I did not try. But everything else, I tried those sending out emails, uh, letters, postcards, going door to door. I've knocked on hundreds of different um, clinics here in Las Vegas. I do remember something that worked for us. One of the things that Cynthia, one of the trainers and the business coaches right now, I understand, uh, she mentioned to us uh, that we also need to become a perceived expert. Yeah, we don't have to be an expert. We just need to be perceived as an expert. Exactly. Uh, so, so what I did back then was uh, I was introduced to to LinkedIn during the training. I didn't know what LinkedIn was before that. So uh, they told us, okay, you can create a LinkedIn profile. I did that. I created a profile. Then I, during the process of uh, setting up my uh, account, I discovered that there are groups that you can actually join. So right. I selected uh, the groups that are related to medical billing, coding, uh, medical revenue systems, those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, and I discovered that when you sign up to those, you can actually opt to have like the, uh, what do you call that? The, the summary of what were posted in that group sent to you every day as an email. Yeah. So, so I didn't have any client, so I had the time, all the time to actually open up one of those, uh, the, the Daily Digest, something like that, the right, Daily right. Digest. And I could see the headlines in there. If there's something interesting going on or whatever, I click on that. I read just the first uh, one or two paragraphs, so I actually get a grasp of what they're talking about. And so, I mean, I didn't memorize anything. I just, I just kind of read those things. So... I became aware of what was going on at that time. It was the the meaningful use incentives or the switch from ICD-9 to ICD-10, those kinds of things. So what happened, how that benefited me is actually, and this is how I got my first client. So uh, there was a new startup in town, or new startup, I mean, there was a startup uh, clinic in town that who, when I first got in touch with them, they just uh, signed up with a biller the day before. So I was kind of late uh, into the system, but that's fine. Uh, like I told you every, almost every day I went uh, door knocking in all of the clinics here. Yeah. So every one or two weeks I passed by that clinic and talked to the owner. Um, and I mean, I, I kind of built a report with them. So that's it doesn't matter that I, was, I wasn't billing for them or whatever. But what happened was because I was always there the moment they had a problem with their biller, yes. guess whose uh, one foot is already inside the door. <laughs> so, that's correct. And that's actually how I got into the business. That's the that, yeah. That's the owner I signed up on Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. So now uh, I guess he got uh, impressed with the service that we did for him, and he referred us to a friend of his. And that's how everything grew right now. All of our clients, I can still draw some kind of a tree going back into the very first client because the only thing working for us right now is word of mouth. Now, I'm not saying that had I continued doing the different kinds of marketing that were taught to us, they wouldn't have worked. But the thing is, we stopped doing them because we got all of these uh, clients based on the word of mouth. Right. Yeah. That's how I got into my position right now. <laughs> and you know, and I know people are probably thinking, gosh, why did it take him 13 months? Uh, and I'm going to address that because that's what, that's some of the things that we're doing now, kind of shortening that gap. And one of the things that you said was this whole LinkedIn uh, part of it. So we're, 
we're really diving in that. We're kind of teaching some of that and then linking that with this the HIPAA compliancy part of it and then doing these webinars and it's and it's making th that time a little bit shorter. However, let's fast forward from your first client to today. How many clients do you have today? Uh, I, I think it's 30 or 31. I'm not uh, very sure of the exact number. It would be around 30 or 31. But aside from that, we are right now working with uh, Jordan of iClaim uh, into setting up four more. We're actually in the process wow. of setting up four more Amazing. clients, which will soon be on board uh, between a week from now to uh, probably a month from now. So the not only did you have a monetary investment, you have a little you had a little bit of time investment. And let's you know, people think, wow, 13 months to get my first client. I don't know if I can do that. However, <laughs> the, the investment that you made there has turned out to be where you are today, 30 to 31, adding another four clients. And and one of the things that you and I were talking about right before we started here, you're kind of capping out at that. You so you're kind of going, eh, I think that's about a, that's all I want to do right now which is a great position to be in because you even said that you're having to turn away some other doctors that may want to do billing. So, you know, I'm so glad that you kind of just gave the kind of, I, I say just the raw data out there, you know, how long it took you, you, you were not a salesperson. You took some of the things that we taught, some work, some didn't work. You found your niche, what you finally find kind of where, where it worked with you. And I agree with you 100% because that's what we're teaching our new licensees now. Learn to become the subject matter expert. And as you mentioned, Cynthia is teaching that. She's really diving into that. So since the time that you started, you said that was 2012, right? Yes, yes. Okay. To 2019, so almost seven years, we've developed so many new things to kind of help expedite that subject matter expert to our licensees we've we've included i'm going to show this uh to everybody on the screen here let me see if i can grab this real quickly uh just for people's uh i don't think we had this when you were you first started uh but we've we've added this book here called the new the new thriving medical practice and what's good about this is that folks you can see right down at the bottom where it says the forward by susan smith cmrm that's a certified medical revenue manager Albert, I don't think we had this for you, uh, whatever yeah. you came through. Uh, yeah, but, uh, we didn't have that uh, at that time, but Patrick did send me a copy of that. Yeah. Uh, Eric, um, let me just go back to, I mean, I mean, people might be wondering, how is that related to how I got my first client, you know, uh, being the perceived expert? I forgot to uh, elaborate on that. So sure. what, what, how it actually benefited me was, like I told you, uh, it's the same uh, set of clinics that I knocked on like every two weeks or so so yep. how i built a kind of a relationship to the owner that i didn't build for was because every time i was there uh if he thought of some kind of an issue going on at that time he would ask me and for whatever reason because of those linkedin daily digests i was able to give an opinion on what was going on so that's actually how how <laughs> that being an ex a perceived expert got me my first client so i forgot to yeah. elaborate on that a while ago yeah you know, folks, I'm, I'm going to say if, if any of the, the folks that are on here today, um, if you're if you're getting close to making the decision and I say within the next 30, 40, 60 days, go ahead and get you a, uh, a LinkedIn account and do exactly what Albert just said to do. Go out there and start joining some of these medical billing, medical coding groups, start getting these feeds in that will start helping you i mean obviously you can join our webinars every wednesday and patrick and i are through the the interviews that we do we give you a ton of information already so think of this as part of your training then when you make that switch over from just being an attendee of, on a wednesday webinar and you become a licensee and now you go through your training you've already got one step ahead of you because now you've already got your linkedin account you're starting to do some due diligence and then since the way that we've got training set up now, which is online, as you go through your training, this gives you some opportunities to start putting some of that into practice. Albert, you remember whenever you came to training, we had five days and we just poured everything that we knew on top of you within five days. Now we've kind of got it spread out a little bit so a, a brand new licensee can learn it, go apply it, and then start coming back and then have this discussion on with, uh, with Cynthia and really start to develop some great, I mean, now we've seen some of the licensees 
get clients within, you know, really within a 30, three months to six month period. So we're really seeing this shorten that gap. And so this is what's so great about it. Now, now we're taking folks that have never been in sales, never know anything about medical billing and really expediting their first client. So this is really good. I'm excited. And that's one of the reasons why I'm excited about what some of the things that I'm doing here. Folks, let me remind you before, because we're getting down somewhat towards the bottom of the hour already. <clears throat> if you've got any specific questions you'd like to ask Albert, I'm monitor monitoring that question box there. So feel free to uh, ask Albert a question. So this is this is a great time. Until then, Albert, let's let's kind of get back to some of the things now, now, once you've got that first client, uh, kind of walk us through that support mechanism here at ABS. What did you find at ABS that helped you take it from really, like you said, and, and that is such a classic thing that you said. Uh, we, we hear that quite often. Uh, Patrick, I got a client, I got a signed contract. Now what, what do I do now? Kind of, kind of talk us through that first uh, couple of weeks after you got that signed contract. Yeah, so uh, like I said, uh, the first hour of the next business day, the following Monday, what I did was to call, uh, it was still Casey doing the support at that time. Right. And uh, yeah, so he was able to give me the step-by-step -step things to do. I mean, uh, you can do this and while waiting for the results of that, you can already start doing this and start doing this, fill this up and whatever. Uh, well, to be honest, uh, for that first account, I told you it was the uh, Thanksgiving weekend but we actually were not able to submit any claims until January the following year. I mean, it took us more than a month and it's because it's the first account that we're setting up. I didn't know what to do. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, ABS was able to tell me, like I said, step by step on uh, what to do. And the iClaim people also helped us a lot. Um, they provided the uh, training. I mean, I, had, I, I watched you do the demo uh, on me when we were signing up, yes. but uh, and they also showed us how to use it on the uh, training itself. But like you said, it actually benefits now that you've kind of spread it apart. Otherwise, we would be absorbing things like a sponge during the five-day training. Um, so, I mean, to be honest, once we got home and since we didn't have any client yet at that time, I, I couldn't remember anymore what to do, how, what to do with the software. And so um, ABS and iClaim were able to help us uh, do those. Now, uh, because we've kind of gotten used to it, uh, it doesn't take us more than a month to set up right. the, uh, I mean, right now, if we have a new client and we're opening a, a new iClaim account for that client, um, for the most part, we already have everything that's required before we even uh, uh, open up that account. So now it takes just a couple of days for us to actually start billing. But at that time, we needed the support uh, people to kind of show us what to do step by step. and. You know, it was a very scary first client experience, but uh, nice to remember. <laughs> Here you are, what, seven years later, and you're up over 30 clients. Uh, we got a question coming in from Jeff. Jeff's asking uh, to you, Albert, what kind of practices are the majority of your clients? Yeah, so the majority of our clients are primary care practices. Um, and in fact, only two are not. And then uh, aside from that, a lot of our practices also are house call practices. Um, so we kind of found our niche in the industry. I mean, the yeah. healthcare industry is uh, very large. It's not that we're limiting ourselves to just those kinds of practices. We were open to any specialty. It's just that, like I told you, we uh, grew by word of mouth. So the tendency is one kind of practice to pursue to a friend of theirs is also the same kind of practice. So sure. the, the reason why most of our practices are house call practices. It's simply because of the word of mouth, but it's not like we limited ourselves to those. And uh, the software does not limit us to any particular uh, specialty anyway, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and when you say house calls, this, this is uh, instead of the patient going to a doctor's office, I think you're, you're, you're working with doctors that are actually making house calls, correct? Exactly. That's exactly it. Some are, some are combined uh, clinics and house calls. Uh, we even have, a few that are uh, strictly house calls only. Yep, yeah, those are good. I mean, I, I, I know of one here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that does it, he's a nurse practitioner. And so I, I, I clearly understand what, uh, you, what you're doing there. Lee is asking, very something sort of similar, you can maybe expand this a little bit more, but uh, he says, you know, what does your client base look like? 
Uh, is it is it sole practices? Is it a small group? Is it a large group? Kind of what? Well, kind of tell us about that. Yeah, we have everybody, all kinds of things. I mean, uh, we have uh, solo practices. Uh, one doctor doing his clinic all by himself. We have groups. Uh, we have doctors who hires NPs, and so. Yeah. Uh, multiple providers, even though there's just one doctor, and we have doctor groups. And actually, uh, one of the things that uh, kind of made us expand a little bit faster than uh, I would have expected is because, because of these medical groups. Uh, so how we expanded, at least part of how we expanded is that one of the doctors employed by the group decides to open his or her own practice. And so automatically, it's us that they contact to kind of help set them up and yep. that's that's one of the ways we grew there you go absolutely so it's, you just kind of well i think that's what i said you kind of you've got such a following now <laughs> so to say uh, <laughs> yeah. your doctors are going i'm a part of this group but i think i want to kind of go start my own thing and oh by the way albert will you still do my billing so they kind of split off and then so it's kind yeah. of it's kind of reproducing itself almost within your with your with your the kind of the niche that you've kind of gotten into that's pretty so cool of how, how exactly. that works. Cool. Yeah. They, i mean still part of the perceived expert thing i guess so. <laughs> yes and 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 that's that is i think we're kind of starting to see somewhat of that become even more popular throughout the country so folks that are on the call you're kind of thinking gosh how, how do i market and who do i market to it certainly could be to some doctors that might be trying to figure out how to expand their practice. And one of those ways is they might be able to hire a nurse practitioner. So one of the things you might think about talking with them about is, hey, have that nurse practitioner see some patients in the home and start developing that, that whole realm of it. So uh, you can make this business to whatever you want to make it. And so there's many different ways that you can kind of attack this, what you kind of say is the beast. Uh, out there as you're trying to figure out what specialty you want to go after and hopefully that's why we do these webinars because you get to hear real things that are happening in real time and also the different specialties that are out there because i think even the home visit care is a specialty in and of itself even though it's family medicine it's sort of a specialty because even there's a different code that's being used instead of a code that uh, is, takes place of a patient seeing being seen in the office it's actually a home visit code. And, and so it's, it's, but the software, as Albert said, is still usable. The iClaim platform is multifaceted. So you can use it where the doctor seeing patients in the home, even in the hospital, if they're seeing patients in the clinic. So there's many different ways that that, that can actually be done. Lee's asking another question here for you, Albert, for your 31 clients that you have currently right now, how many employees do you have running those clients? Oh, okay, right now, um, aside from me and my wife, we have 10 employees. Um, okay. Not all of them are full-time. Um, two of them are part-time working from home, actually. Uh, we have a very small office. So, I mean, while, while we're constantly getting bigger and bigger offices um, every year, we, we, we want to remain small. I mean, I, want, I don't want an office that occupies the whole floor of a building. Of uh, right now, um, we have two large rooms and all of our desks are side by side with our employees. So, I mean, but to answer the question, uh, we have uh, 10 of them aside from me and my wife currently working in the business. Yeah, and kind of talk about how your day is because that, that was really interesting. I like how you were, you were saying that you've got your your employees working the claims, but then you you and Army kind of do something after that, kind of work walk through that process for us. Yeah, yeah, so, so um, Right now, uh, all of the 10 employees, uh, their task is to create the claims throughout the day. Uh, me and Army, our real work begins uh, at about 4 p.m. because that's when the claims are finished. And so we've decided, I mean, it's not required, but we've decided to make it a point to uh, review each and every claim that they do. Um, so we, I mean, me and Army are the ones who click on the submit button for the day. And right. so even though we probably could hire more employees uh, and get more clients, uh, you mentioned a while ago that we've come to the point where we sometimes turn away potential clients. So the reason for that is because while we can hire more employees to do these claims, there's only so much Army and I can do at the end of the day. Um, yeah, so my, my mornings are spent doing meetings, uh, visiting the clients, 
And then uh, at around 4 p.m., that's when the real work for me and ARMY begin. Now, um, uh, the, one of the things we've learned in this business is that if you train the employees of your clients well, I mean, if you take time to actually teach them well, uh, you would need fewer employees because uh, most of the things coming to you are ready to submit. So. <laughs> right, right, yeah. And in line with that, there's another question that came in from Eric. He's saying, uh, so how do you deal with rejected claims and what is the average claim rejection percentage that you're dealing with right now? Uh, okay, so uh, again, this comes back to what I told you that if you uh, take time to actually train the person in the uh, practice who will be sending you the information that you're going to submit, uh, I mean, I'm guessing that our rejection uh, percentage would be at the most two or three percent, might be even right. less than that. Uh, and, and, and most of it comes into the practice uh, vetting the patients correctly. I mean, doing the eligibility checks and everything. Uh, yeah. You don't expect to be the one doing the eligibility checks for them because, uh, I mean, by the time you find someone who's not eligible, it's too late. They already saw the patient. So uh, right. the secret is to actually have them do the job well. I mean, you're not the one paying them. It's the employees of the practice, but it benefits you if they do their job well. Because yeah. the things that are coming to you are almost ready to submit. Yeah, and are your employees are are they on an hourly wage or you pay? How do you how do you how do you? Yeah, they are W two employees. Okay. Yep. Just so. Just there was a time when uh, there was a time when we had an employee out of state uh, uh, that we had to pay by ten ninety nine, but uh, that's because they are out of state. But right now everybody is here in Las Vegas. Uh, yeah. Like I said, uh, we only have two employees who sometimes they're in the office, sometimes they work at home because of personal uh, circumstances and because we have a tiny office. So. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Army, yeah, Army awesome. works from home. Yeah, Army works from home. So, absolutely. That, that's the, you're the owners. You can work from home. You can work from yeah. anywhere, as you as you yeah. obviously know. Uh, yeah, exactly. Lee's asking another question, and I think uh, I think you've said this, but I think there's a little bit of clarity. He, he's asking, are your 31 clients including in uh, I'll rephrase that. Are your 31 clients including groups, or is that the number of doctors you're building for? Oh, no, those are the number of groups. Okay, that's the number of groups. Okay, and there's wow. one of them with uh, with 20 providers. One of them has 20 providers. So. Oh, my word. <laughs> so good so, clarification, Lee. So yeah. when you were talking about 31 clients, it's not 31 individual doctors. We're talking yep, about those 31, are 31 groups. Yeah. So out of... It, it, what, what do you think now? Because the question is going to come up. So, what do you think the all the providers? How many providers are there now? Uh, if you count them individually, it will be over a hundred. But let me tell you now that uh, we have a few nurse practitioners working across uh, two or three different groups. Uh, yeah. I know if they're part time in one group, uh, part time in another group, and part time in a third group sometimes. Uh, and all three groups are our clients, so that might double. But I'm I can be sure that it would be over a hundred if I uh, if I number them individually. And that's also I mean going back to how we expanded. That's another uh, way yeah. that we expanded when a nurse practitioner works in two different groups, and then he or she introduces us to the other group, and that's yeah. another client for us. There you go. Yeah. Uh, Jeff's asking the question, kind of going back on to the rejected claims, is there a report to run in the software to get the rejected claim results? Actually, I, Jeff, I can answer that question for you. Inside of iClaim, not only can you run a report on that, but let me, I don't know if I can, uh, I'm just going to just at least show you the iClaim platform real quickly. Uh, inside, and this is this is a good thing to do, Jeff, if you'd like to. Uh, get a do get a demo done because underneath where it says billing, I'm just kind of pointing to that up there, and then you you click on that, and then you want to get to the part where it says um, the uh, the dashboard, the the billing dashboard. When you get to that, you'll be able to see things in real time. So when claims are processed, and because the clearinghouse is actually inside of the iClaim platform, you're able to see that. So that claim status dashboard will kind of give you in real time, Jeff that information the doctors can see that so obviously but you know specific reports yeah you can run reports on just about anything uh, underneath there albert talking about reports you know on a typical monthly basis what are some of the reports you think that your doctors want to see i mean I, I i know at a point you get to a point where the doctor is going the only report i want to know about is the cash that's coming in <laughs> so yeah as long as they know they've got money coming in the bank they're not so heavily uh, 
wanting reports. But obviously, sometime in the beginning, you know, a doctor wants to know to look at reports. What were some of the key reports that you use for your doctors? Well, you're absolutely correct in that uh, that's the number one thing they always ask for. And that's why I automated the process for each of my clients on the first day of the month. Uh, it automatically generates a report uh, for the past month. And that kind of report may vary from uh, uh, like some of them would like a summary. Uh, basically, the individual checks that were deposited into their account and that will yeah. show it. Some of them wants to see on a per patient basis, how much they got out of each claim for each patient, and we're able to automate that process. Um, some of them, I, I, I mean, I don't even know why, but some of them wants uh, like a spreadsheet of the demographics of all the patients that were seen the previous month. Yeah, I mean, they need it, so let's give it to them. The point is there are more reports than I can use. You know, I claim some of them, I don't even know what they're for, but they're there. And there are instances, Eric, when actually, there are very specific reports that we thought would not be available in uh, iClaim. And yeah. so we kind of do the process manually, spend several days foolishly, only for me to find out once I get fed up and call uh, uh, iClaim support that yeah. I could actually have done that, generated the same kind of report I was doing manually. It's in the system. I just needed to yeah. learn how to do them. And now I'm not going to pretend that somebody or anybody can actually master all of the reports. So you can always call them. That's the lesson I learned. Just call them and they'll be able to help you. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Uh, great question here on employees again from Eric. He's asking, so when you hire another, another W2 employee, are you looking for people that have a background in coding and billing? Or do you like to take someone and individually train them yourself from, from scratch? Yeah, so uh, it depends on the position I'm filling. Some of them, uh, if, it's a, if it's a data entry uh, position, like if I have a practice who sends me the super bills correctly, there's very few things that need to be changed. So I, you can actually hire uh, somebody to do the data entry for that. You don't need a certified builder or coder to do that. Somebody, I prefer somebody with a background in working in a clinic, maybe the front desk, because they, they already know what kind of information is needed from a patient. Uh, right. so, so that doesn't necessarily have to be a medical builder or coder. It can be a medical assistant or not even somebody trained to do that, but experienced in the in the kind of job that you do so but there are others where if i need somebody to do the ar on a like a bi-weekly basis or something it helps if it's an experienced builder right yeah. but yeah. but what i what i learned is that no matter who you hire you're always going to have to train him or her uh, okay. because you know i mean every every business has its own workflow and we kind of have to adapt him or her to our own workflow um, the one thing that um, uh, I haven't experienced is, I don't know why, <laughs> I haven't uh, tried hiring somebody who, who like is ready to run the business for you. I mean, I wow. know some of you might be thinking that way. Uh, I still want to run my business right now. Uh, probably yeah. I will get into that point where <laughs> I just want to leave somebody in there to run the business for me, but not now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, so let's, let's, uh, we've got about another 15 minutes here before the top of the hour. So let me kind of start, uh, wrapping up a few things here. What, as we're kind of closing out the webinar here in just a little bit, Albert, what would be the thing that, that you would like to share with the people on today? Uh, you know, putting, again, putting yourself in their position again, thinking about if they would, it, this is one of the questions that you would have asked and what would what would that be what was some kind of a great advice you can give to folks on the webinar today yeah exactly so so you know uh during that time th those 13 months when i haven't signed any client yet and and even after i signed the first one uh the truth is it was only after it was only maybe on the fourth client where we actually began to break even uh or or not break even but actually take some money into the bank yeah. uh, for ourselves it was only during the third client i think but i mean during that period of time when we weren't at that point yet you know the struggles uh, the 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 um, uh what do you call that the the daily uh, thought of uh, do i want to continue this or whatever so so i there's a tendency to think that it's only you who's undergoing that thing um 
you know, there's a there's a podcast right now. It's called the How I Built This Podcast uh, from National Public Radio. Uh, I mean, you don't have to listen to NPR to see those. There's a website. You can search How I Did This. It's an NPR podcast, and the episodes are available there. So where I'm going at is if you go through all of these episodes, uh, the guests are the guests are always somebody who's opened a business and the, the kinds of uh, people they guess there is like the founder of uh, Kate Spade, the founder of uh, Ben and Jerry's, uh, Stitch Fix, yeah. Lara yeah. Bar, the Energy Bar Company, or, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, you that's when you will realize that it's not only you. All of these people, even if they are in a different line of business you can totally relate to the things that they went through. It's the same things that you are going through today if you are still struggling to get your first client. So uh, there's there's some kind of a satisfaction in knowing that it's not just you. There's satisfaction in relating to the struggles that they have. Yeah. And see, there's satisfaction in knowing that one day you'll make it. Just don't yeah. give up. You know, that's a, that, that is, I am so glad that you kind of brought that up because again, you know, sometimes you feel like you're just in this one little bubble and, it, and it's just happening just to you. And it's good to know that, you know, the, when you become an entrepreneur and you're you're going out there and you're fledging out and you're just doing it because, man, this is you just know this is what you want to do. Can you make that money? Yes. You get your your, your ROI back. You, you start to see it start to develop. You kind of go through peaks and valleys in the first year, the second year. And then finally you get to that point where it's kind of like, it's just clicking. And that's where you, it, it, and you're right. It's it's the stick to itiveness if you want to call it that, of any type of entrepreneur that you go out there and you just do it. Uh, like you said, there are some people that have maybe put it aside. We've actually had people buy in, put it aside for a little bit and then get back into it. And then now they're, they're, they're successful. You know, they're like yourself. You said, I'm sticking with it and I'm, you know, I'm going to get out there and make it. And you did. And here is someone, like you said yourself, you weren't a salesperson, but you knew and you were determined to, to make a business for you and your family. And, you know, seven years later, you know, here you are, you're dealing with 31 client groups, over a hundred doctors that you're doing billing for. And, you know, the reward has paid off. You're, you I always talk to people, and I think you might remember this, Albert. You know, I like to tell people you, the monetary investment is just one of the investments. The other investment is just getting out there and letting people know that you're in business and then learning. And, and, I, and I applaud you. I really, really do. My hat is off to you because of what you did. You went out there on LinkedIn, you got involved with these groups. You kept your learning going. That learning paid off because it helped you get that first client, talk intelligently to that first client. You just didn't rely upon the training that you received. I mean, you really got out there and you you are what I would call a very classic entrepreneur here in the United States. So again, congratulations to you and what you've been able to accomplish there. And uh, so tell me, tell us again, it, that was on NPR. And what's the title of that podcast? how i built this how i built this we're going to put that over in the chat area here in just a little bit so you can kind of go check that out and, and again folks these are things that we're trying to give you right now to get you prepared to get going in this business and, and really make something uh happen let me see if there are any oh yeah i got another question that came in here uh eric says if you are able to kind of go back when you when you started uh, would you do anything differently to get clients as far as marketing and advertising to doctors? Yeah, I mean, um, there are a lot of things that I would have done differently. Um, I, I'll give you specific examples. Um, this is not exactly the answer to what he's asking, but you know how um, when you sign up to be a licensee of ABS, it's actually a package of, uh, at that time, it was eight businesses, uh, eight different lines of business, but I believe now it's nine or ten or something. Yeah. So. It's a package of different services that you can actually provide. Um, I I got into the trap of uh, being comfortable with one of them, medical billing, because that's the first one uh, that I was able to uh, actually get a client for. Looking back, if I could have actually concentrated on also getting them to sign up with the EMR and the coding services, that's the trifecta. I mean, if you get them to use the EHR, then there's practically nothing else you need to do but uh, send the claim. And if you're actually able to get them um, 
sign up for the coding services, the code write services. That's a trifecta, like I said, because if all three services are provided to a single client, there's nothing more that you need to do but submit the claim. Don't need to review anything. The coding people will do that. So where I'm going at is if I could just go back and kind of concentrate on all servicing just three of those eight or nine different um, services that I could have uh, given, I would have doubled my revenue right now. Um, but I mean, it's hindsight is always 2020. What happened was after we signed up our first client, then second, then third, I kind of forgot all of those different things. And there was even a time, I mean, I don't know if you believe that, believe it, but there was a time when one of my clients called me in the middle of the night uh, looking for an emergency coding service. I mean, it was urgent to him to kind of look for a coding service that they can use so as not to interrupt their uh, yeah. practice. You know what happened? I kind of referred him to a client that I got to know in LinkedIn who does coding services only for me to realize the following morning that what the hell did I just do? I mean, I provide code write services. I mean, so I got I, that. <laughs> yeah, so if I were to go back and um, th that's one of the things I would have done differently. Yeah. I mean, and you know what? That's, that's, that, that happens. I mean, you get so involved and you get so locked in, you think, I got to get a client, I got to get a billing client. And then, you, then you get one and then you kind of get lost in the weeds. And so, that's why, you know, we here at ABS, we stay so involved with our licensees. And we obviously, we're not calling every licensee and saying, hey, remember, we've got these other services. But we, we do. And one of the things I'm kind of showcasing here is, as again, we're kind of getting things wrapped up here. Uh, over to the left, you can see Compliancy Guard. Folks, let me kind of tell, tell this to you. Every year, a doctor has to have a, a HIPAA audit, and they have to do self-audits. And, and just kind of kind of let you peek back behind the curtain of what we're going to be talking about next week with our, for our licensees and teaching their doctors. They actually have to go through six self-audits a year because it only takes one patient to turn that doctor in before the Office of Civil Rights will start coming into that doctor's office and finding out if they're in compliance or if there's violations. It just takes one. And one of the things that the Office of Civil Rights is going to do, the first question is, let me see your audits that you have done currently on record and documented. So, that's one of those services that Albert's talking about. It's kind of like, duh, should have had a V8 moment. This is how we're actually teaching our licensees get into the door and automatically having a conversation with a office manager and if not the doctors themselves on one of our services. And, that, and folks, that's really all you want in the very beginning is just to get a conversation going. Or as Albert has said, you want to show forth that expertise, that subject matter expert. This is automatically given that to you. Murma is the group that's actually hosting the webinar for you. All you're doing is inviting people to the webinar. And you talk about Albert, I wish we'd have had this in place for you when you, you know, 2012, because I could have said, Albert, this is what I need for you to do. I need to take this little flyer. I need you to go to the doctor's office and say, I need to speak to the HIPAA uh, compliance officer. They're going to look at you like a calf staring at a new gate. And then all of a sudden, the office manager comes out and you kind of say, hi, I'm Albert with whatever your medical billing company name is. I'm here to invite you to a webinar to make sure that you're ready for 2020 with all of your HIPAA audits. And, and automatically, you get this audience, you get this conversation going. So folks, what Albert just said is was a golden key nugget. That is where you are. That's what we're doing to help you out with. Albert, you are great today. <laughs> I, I love. Oh, there's a Tamika says, quick question. Uh, how many territories thus far does Eric have? And honestly, they limited. You must be talking about uh, Albert. Um, there are there's not a limited territory. You don't you're not limited to there's no limits. You can have doctors. Uh, I, mean, I think you're kind of concentrating there, though, in the Las Vegas area. No, no. I have oh, more okay. clients outside Nevada. So okay. I have clients from California to Florida, even in Hawaii. Oh, wow. 
Even That's here in Dallas, I like actually. Trip to Hawaii. Wow, what yeah. an odd, what a, <laughs> Yeah, I have a client right where you are in Dallas, Texas. Look, there, look at this, man, you're all over the place. Yeah. Uh, one last question from Eric. How long does it take uh, for an average claim to be processed and then to be paid? About two weeks, I would say oh. the average. Yeah. But but to but to process a claim, what does it take someone oh, to process? Yeah. A claim? It takes you minutes to submit it. You just have to okay. wait until it's paid. If that's what he's asking, how many, how much time it takes to actually submit that claim? Uh, from seconds to minutes, depending if it's a new patient or if it's a, an established patient. But yeah. I mean, once you submit it, there's nothing else to do until it gets paid or it gets denied. So yep. and then you work it and you take care of it from there. Yeah. But yeah, mm -hmm. less than less than two weeks, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Albert, listen, my friend, can, first of all, congratulations. I, I know if Patrick were on here, he would just be all over himself because he just, he just loves to hear these stories. I love to hear the stories. I'm, I am honored to be uh, able to have uh, had this conversation with you. So again, from us to you, from ABS, really congratulations to you and Army. Well, thank you very much. I like seeing this story again and again if needed because, I mean, the business has been very good for me and Army. It's been a life changer for us. And, I mean, there's no reason why anybody else can't enjoy the same kind of satisfaction we had out of uh, signing up and opening the business. Yeah, we've got some great people. Tamika says, awesome, thank you. Um, you know, that was my mission. Great job. Uh, Albert and Eric, thank you for the webinar, your advice. Happy Thanksgiving from Eric. Again, from me to you, Albert, tell your family happy Thanksgiving. Thank you so much for being on here. And let's not make it a year. I mean, we interviewed you sure. a year from 2018 to 2019. We're going to interview you shortly after the first of the year because I want to hear about these other doctors that you've just signed up here again. So thank sure. you so much for being on here. Thank you very much, Eric. And thank you to everybody who listened to us today. Absolutely. Everybody else, hang on there. I'm going to let Albert go again. Albert, see you later. Thank you, brother. Thank you.